this work has been done in uh, collaboration with Bernard Gobe, who's some of the audience here as well. I want to talk about where uh, memory comes from, how we learn memory, how we can represent memory in our crest architecture. Um, it's fairly obvious that any agent exists in a complex world must interpret objects that it sees, and these interpretations are by and large a result of knowledge that you've learned. So here's a phrase I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. Um, the degree of learning we need becomes uh, more apparent if you have a sentence in a script that you're not familiar with. <coughs> so to understand what that means and to better remember it, you'd have to learn what the script means and um, learn to interpret the different pieces. The, um, another type of task would be playing a game like chess and uh, to the novice, there's just like pieces scattered on a, on a board. Um, to an expert, um, you'll find the expert talking about things like night outposts and open uh, files and possible sacrifices <laughs> and so forth. So the level of interpretation that you get would depend on the amount of knowledge that the expert has and what we're looking at is how this process of learning knowledge sort of occurs and how it can be represented and used. So we're using an architecture called CREST. I'm going to do a very brief tour here. Um, the architecture can be divided up into essentially four pieces. We have a facility here for interacting with the external world. We have a simulated eye and ear and hand for carrying actions. <coughs> Features are extracted. And we have down here a limited capacity short-term memories. On the far right, we have a sort of pool of long-term memory pieces of information. We have things that we call chunks, which are familiar patterns. And we can also have production rules and schemata and other things in there. And the distinctive feature of Crest is this discrimination network in here. And this essentially acts as an index into the long-term memory. So as you see things over here, they get sorted through the network, things are retrieved and pointers to them are placed in short-term memory, which can then affect what you look at next. Everything in the architecture is um, resource-bound. There's lots of simulated time constraints which have been built up by matching the processes with um, performances of humans in various experiments. Uh, it's the simulated eye, um, so on the right here, this is uh, a sort of chessboard and the trace pattern of the eye moving across the chessboard. And the eye uses a collection of heuristics and it combines top-down heuristics with bottom-up heuristics. So top-down heuristics, this one here, long-term memory, this is the key one when the model has a large amount of uh, information learnt. And what that means is when it locates some information, it will try to complete that information with other information it expects from its memory. It's also capable of using domain-specific knowledge. If it looks at a piece on the chessboard, it can follow along what its predicted move might be. And there are also bottom-up features, so it's finding a random piece or finding a random square that it's not looked at before. The discrimination network is built up gradually. We have um, a division of the network based on the modality, whether you see something, you hear something, or whether it's an action. And the network has some tests represented here by the shaded nodes. And these clear ones, these are the nodes that it's trying to reach. And these are the ones that are the chunks, the familiar patterns that are stored in long-term memory. So everything is represented in a symbolic fashion. So here is a pawn on square 2-5 or king on square 1-5 to represent the pieces on a chessboard. And that sequence of these chunks is what makes, uh, se sorry, sequence of these Items is what makes up a, a, a chunk in the chest and then. So, given that network, if we were now to see uh, the pattern 1, 2, 5, 1, 5, it would have been sorted down to this node. It disagrees with that pattern down there. We would learn some more chunks by discrimination. And if you notice here, there's only two bits of information there. If we were to see the pattern again, we can learn by familiarization and extend the amount of information in that, in that node. 
So the network is built gradually by discrimination to add more nodes and by familiarization to extend the amount of information. And um, most of the effects of press are due to the properties of this network. When you pass in patterns, what kinds of patterns do you get? Do you get out? So that's the straightforward indexing. It's also possible for CREST to learn links between uh, nodes in the network, and this, ta this process is mediated by the short-term memories. So here we have a task for learning a visual label to go along with a, sorry, a verbal label to go with the visual stimulus. If we sort the visual stimulus, we put node one in the visual short-term memories. If we sort the verbal stimulus, we put a pointer to node two in the verbal memory, and then we can put a link between the two to show that they occur together. So I'm going to use this in a minute when we do the board game interpretations, where the uh, visual stimulus will be a board game, and then links will be made from chunks that are seen on the board game uh, to interpretations. Okay, so. To demonstrate the types of um, memory tasks possible, we've got two models here. Um, the first one is a model of implicit learning, and uh, this was set up to reproduce the results of this paper published in um, the ICCM conference using ATAR. And uh, the strings are from Aviva Grammar, so on the left here, this in the way, you've got strings which are valid, like TTS and VSPS. And you've got some invalid strings over here. The, um, the model requires some way of determining what is unfamiliar. And we use a technique from some of the language learning models uh, of CREST, a model of Lee Van Bok. And essentially, if, when you see the string and you divide it up into familiar chunks, if it needs too many chunks, then will fit in your phonological loop, then you don't know that string. Or if there's too many single element chunks, then you also don't know that string. And when we run the results, um, these are the, um, the results from the human and actar models from that paper also referenced. And um, on the right are the results in CREST, and you will see that there's a very strong correlation in terms of the numbers and the overall effects. Um, the advantage of Crest over the Actar, the models are actually fairly similar, but the advantage of the Crest model of the Actar model is that no additional modeling assumptions, such as how big chunks are, what the chunks should look like, are, are required. Okay, so then we moved on to the idea of interpreting board games. Uh, this is a fairly complex task. Um, in this first uh, task, over here we've got a position after about move 20, and over here again another position about move 20. In the first task, we were asking the model to figure out what opening did these positions come from. So every chess game begins with the first few sequences which pass it in an opening. Things are a little um, vaguer when it gets to this state, um, but it's still possible, and human experts are quite good at saying what what the open is that any position came from. And um, we just, for a, a sort of test of how well Crest was performing, compared this with the statistical learner, support vector machine, and we found that they got more or less the same sort of proportion correct. So we then wanted to move on to trying to interpret positions uh, using a variety of different labels. And I'll just show you what they sort of look like. So here's a position on the top right there, these five labels were the labels given by a master level chess player. So saying things like black controls the open C file, or there's a double D pawn for white, or there's a weak pawn structure for white. So these are the labels that the human player um, gave to a, a database of positions. There are about 500 positions. So I divided that data set up, trained Crest with some of them, and tested it on some of them. and. This table here shows how many interpretations it got correct in the test set. Okay, so these positions is not seen before. So more than half of the positions it found um, <coughs> at least one interpretation that was uh, that was correct. And this example here is the the best one. And um, what I've highlighted there in black 
are the three interpretations that are the same between the model and the master player, and the model put one in that the master player didn't put in, and the master player had two that the, that the model missed. Okay, but essentially, Crest is able to look at the scan this position, look up the chunks in its memory, and retrieve interpretations which uh, are not too far off the mark of what a master has produced. So moving forward, so we've got Crest, which we think is making um, good results in uh, learning and using uh, these memory structures. How can we make, uh, how can we integrate this with um, other aspects of cognitive architecture to make more general architectures? And for me, the interesting question, how do we combine this perceptual learning of Crest with the sort of problem solving that is already done so well by architects like SOAR and ACTAR. And there's a couple of um, quotes here. Um, John Laird, in his recent book, said that um, we need systems that will learn on their own. And um, Pat Langley in a, and Cohen in an article suggests architects need to consider visual, auditory, diagrammatic and other representation schemes. And uh, we would argue that Press currently has this uh, ability to learn the higher level knowledge and it also has this focus on categorization understanding and there are models already existing in diagrammatic visualization similar domains. So what we'd like to propose is that someone like Crest or Crest itself should be combined in some way with something like Actar or SOAR to give us a system that combines this perceptual learning and problem solving. And we just outlined two ways of doing this. Um, one way is um, what's called a dual process way, where we take inspiration from the dual process theories, where you have a system one, an intuitive pattern rate matching, pattern matching process, and a system two, the analytical problem solving process, and we analogously combine CREST with Aptar or SOAR. And it would actually be fairly easy to do this. The output that CREST produces could be quite easily fed in and used as part of Aptar or SOAR. More radically, we might suggest that the two processes should be more integrated so that perceptual recognition and problem solving occur alongside each other. So it's been identified when a chess expert tries to find a move in a position, he uh, looks at variations, but as he's doing the problem solving and analyzing positions, he's always doing pattern recognition alongside. And um, a suggestion of how this approach might work was recently in 97, something called Search, it's only a process model of how press can do this sort of problem solving, but this is something that we're working on implementing uh, at the moment. So just to summarize, um, I've just shown two models of, of press. Short-term implicit learning happens over a few minutes. Longer-term interpretive learning happens over years. And um, we try to argue that press would be a good way of adding in this kind of perceptual knowledge learning into an architecture such as such as SOAR or as an integrated process. And the idea of combining perception with problem solving, I would suggest, is an important direction in making our cognitive architectures more general purpose. Okay.